This video is sponsored by Squarespace. The all-in-one platform to build your business's online presence. So you've been working overtime here and you have the tractor halfway back together. Yeah, it's coming together. Short block all bolted in, all the bottom end stuff, the weight and the wheels back under the front here. I've got the head on. It's not completely torqued yet, but uh, that was where I left off last time I worked on it. So you just have the valve cover sitting on it? Yeah, the valve cover's on there just to keep the dust off. I've got uh, the the head and rocker shaft are on there, but i got to run through and do the final torque and adjust the valves before we button it up. So you have to torque them all down and then adjust the valves? Yes, but the way this is made, see the rocker shaft is bolted down with six of the head bolts. Yeah. So it's kind of a strange procedure because then these bolts in the center here, you can't get at them. Uh, so you have to come in with a, a box end wrench basically hooked on the end of my torque wrench and then adjust the torque so that you have the right to allow for setting. the right length so you have the right setting. And we'll, we'll probably go through some of that when I get to that. Yeah, We're thinking maybe next weekend it'll be running. But for now, fill us in on what kind of the final findings were on the injection pump. Well, the guy that rebuilt the pump for us this time said really the only thing he found is that the fuel delivery rate was turned up probably 20% anyway over stock. I'm not convinced that would have caused any problems. And then the other thing, we kind of lost the smoking gun evidence there when they just ripped into the pump to rebuild it instead of looking at what it was like before. I'm still questioning, and I don't know anything about these pumps. I've never been inside one, but I'm questioning where they put that pin in there because this pump was 180 degrees out of time, which should not have hurt anything other than we had to time it off number six cylinder instead of number one. But I'm wondering if it really was 180 out the way the pump delivered the fuel. I'm wondering if it was a few degrees off one way or the other. Even when we set it up, lined the marks up here on the crankshaft, I'm wondering if what was inside the pump was really what was showing on the marks. I'm still questioning our fuel. I took another sample of the fuel out of the tank on this today and sent it off to a lab down here by Denver. How's that look? How come it ain't red? I stopped somewhere that didn't have the red stuff to put on the road field. It's going to cost me $250 to get it tested, but I'm that curious as to is there still something wrong with the fuel we had in here. And we did a fuel sample clear a year yeah, ago. Yeah, we did a fuel test a year ago. It was not as extensive as what this one is, but a year ago it came back and said the fuel was perfectly fine but I, I'm questioning that because we've narrowed it down to either something with the pump and having an issue with timing or a problem with something with that fuel that is burning extremely hot compared to what diesel should burn. As you're all aware, we've been fortunate enough to partner with some amazing companies to make it possible for us to bring you a new video every week. Today's video is sponsored by Squarespace, who we've been a customer of since 2015. Managing a business is no easy task and making your business stand out against the competition can be even tougher. With Squarespace, it's easy to build a clean and professional website to set your business apart. Their website builder is easy to use even with no prior web design experience, and you can choose from various customizable templates to fit your needs. Once you've picked a template, there are countless built-in features to support your website's needs, such as the ability to link your social media feeds to keep your visitors up to date, or the tools to launch your very own blog. Possibly one of the most important features in my eyes is the fact that all Squarespace websites are optimized for mobile and content automatically adjusts to look great no matter what device a user is on. Be sure to check out squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash jimsautomotive and use code jimsautomotive to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. All right, so you cleaned up the short block. Did you change bearings? No. Oh. No, the bearings still looked fine. There were a couple of little specks of some uh, minute amount of metal that got into them, but uh, not to the point where I felt it would ever be an issue. Uh, in fact, I didn't even look at the main bearings. We obviously looked at the rod bearings when the pistons and rods were out, and they looked absolutely fine. So you didn't change bearings, but you did get new rod bolts from Agco. They're actually ARP bolts. And yeah. I have a clip that I'll put in about that. Okay. 
Well, this particular engine, I haven't seen a lot of these motors. We've had one here and there over the years, but certainly never two of them at the same time to make comparisons and, and realize all the differences over the years. It appears there's an early engine, a middle series, and a late series as far as connecting rod bolts go here. Our engine falls into the middle series of engines. They use the socket head cap screws for rod bolts as they're grade 100. And as you read through this, that particular bolt is not required to be replaced. It's probably good practice to change the bolts. But anyway, the first time I overhauled this, I did not change the bolts. I think that was the first time this engine had ever been apart. There was no distress of any kind in the bearings. So I felt like, especially being my own motor, sometimes when you do your own stuff, you cut corners that you normally wouldn't for a customer's engine. But anyway, I reused the, the cap screws and rods. Well, now we're one more rebuild down the road here and one more time of torquing and untorquing and torquing again on those rod bolts. So I thought maybe it'd be a good idea to replace them. At least two of them there uh, suffered additional stress just pulling that piston up and down the cylinder. Doesn't show on the bearing at all. The bearings look great, but uh, there just has been more stress on there than it normally would have been. So anyway, we have decided to put in the new updated cap screws. I think it's kind of interesting. They're actually made by ARP. Agco is sourcing their rod bolts from ARP and the new bolts have a pretty specific torque procedure to get them torqued where they want to be. But another thing that we were not aware of that we found in the instructions with these bolts, the rod bearings on this engine, since there is no piston cooling of any kind, was just a solid bearing shell. The replacement bearings and the only bearing you can get at this point are the slotted bearings, as you can see there for the rods that have the piston cooling nozzle in the top of them. In the instructions here, they specify that engine with our serial number, you are to remove the nod slotted bearings and replace with the slotted type, rotate the piston and rod 180 degrees in the cylinder sleeve so the bearing slots are on the camshaft side. That slot has no function whatsoever in this engine. That slot only functions on the uh, piston cooled type looks, connecting rods. And on those, engines the rod basically has a passage from the main or from the rod bearing that i guess pressurizes the pin yes and then it goes around the pin bushing and it has a little squirter in the top here that sprays up into the piston yeah. and you can see on our rods here they are not drilled the only way the pin bushing gets oil is just from splash what drains back down in through the hole in the top there. The oil hole will always keep that slot of the bearing full of oil when you're coming down on the power stroke. If it did have the piston cooling, that's part of how it feeds the well, cooler. And on our engine, I'm just assuming it has something to do with keeping more oil in the bearing. If it wasn't turned around, I don't think it would have ever hurt anything on this engine. It certainly would on a piston cooled engine, but it is something else Chalmers felt needed to be done. So you put the sleeves in with the O-rings in the same position? I did not change the position of the O-rings. Again, that's based off of the material guidelines from the manufacturer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they still look backwards to an old school Al Chalmers guy, but they are right according to the manufacturer. Yeah, they're right according to the, the modern stuff that's being manufactured at this point. Yes, and I so. used the same uh, tire glide uh, tire assembly lube that I've always used on this kind of stuff. Sleeves went in super fine. P got them down there, a little bit of a twist and push, and they were seated. And Piston the wall clearance we measured, and I've got five cylinders that came out at five thousandths. My number three cylinder, and everybody needs to remember that, so if this engine comes apart again, mm -hmm. Number three cylinder is four thousandths clearance. The piston was just a little bit larger on that one. Spec is two and a half to five. It's in spec, and again, I don't think that was any of our problem the first time around. It might have become a problem it, after everything else started heating up. Yeah, it would not have been a problem if we didn't have the combustion temperature that we had. Yeah. I'm going to put a clip in that we filmed a little bit earlier talking about the way the coolant flows through the block. People's intuition... On a lot of engines, water pump being at the front distributes your coolant from front to back, basically. Right. And the back cylinders do get the hottest. Yeah, you end up with the, the front cylinder being super cooled because the water pump's pushing the water in right there. And then the water gradually heats up and then you end up with your back one or two cylinders somewhat 
overheated because the water is already hot before it ever gets to them. When we got looking at this a little bit more, water comes into the pump, then basically there's a hole in the block right here that goes kind of to a passage yeah, into it, it this. Yeah, looks, it looks like it goes both ways. It can either go directly into the block itself or goes on over into this passage here, which comes back to the oil cooler, which sits on the side of the block here. And once the coolant passes through the oil cooler, by then it goes back into that same goes passage. Back into that same passage again. Right there in the middle. And if you look from inside the block here where the cylinder liners go in, there is an opening right next to each one of the uh, cylinders to distribute the coolant cool water from the radiator is coming into all six cylinders theoretically equally and once it passes around through the block the head gasket here is what meters the coolant coming on up into the head coolant has to go around all the sleeves and then come up into the head where it moves forward then and comes out the thermostat mm -hmm. at the front corner of the head from what we're looking at theoretically maybe actually a more well cooled engine than some and then this here, when the thermostat is closed, this is your water pump bypass hose. So even when the thermostat is closed, the water pump can still continue to pump coolant across through this passage and circulate it throughout the block, uh, with the exception of it's just going through the block so that the block heats up faster. And then once the thermostat opens, it somewhat blocks this off and pushes the coolant through the radiator. I did measure piston cylinder wall clearance the first time around and felt it was acceptable. I did not measure piston ring end gap because I didn't want to have to pull the stretch the rings one more time to get them off the piston so I could check the measurement. I just assumed as manufactured they should be fine. This time, considering the amount of trouble we had, I did pull all of the rings off and checked my end gaps. Top ring end gap, if I recall correctly, is 13 to 28 thousandths. Out of the box, I was a little disappointed in those rings. They ranged everywhere on that top ring from about 14, I think, to 19. I was a little bit surprised how uneven the end gaps were. Uneven and tight. Uneven and tight, yes, on the tight side of specs. They were in spec, but not by very much. Considering the problem we had and how close they were to the tight side of specs, I chose to file the end gaps to put them right in the middle of spec. So I went ahead and we filed the end gaps and made all of the top rings in the 20 to 21 thousandths range. I don't remember the spec on the second, third, and oil ring. It's a little bit tighter gap, but I did the same thing. I put every one of those right in the middle of spec. I don't feel like doing that makes it a sloppy loose engine. But on the flip side, it doesn't make it on the tight side to where there's no room for any errors along the way. That is probably the biggest change I made of anything we did here is just the fact we opened up the end gap on the rings a little bit. Yeah, so that covers kind of the bottom end because you didn't mess with the crank, flip the didn't, rods around. I didn't take the front cover off. I did kind of minimum amount that I could here. Had this been a customer's motor, I might have torn it down a little bit further. But my own, I felt confident that that we could do it again next year. Yeah, we could do it again <laughs> next year. Make this our yearly getting ready to farm routine. Yeah. I hope not. <laughs> in the next video, I wanna reveal how much we're actually into this thing. But the head, originally, we talked about just cleaning it up a little bit and putting it back in. Yeah. Because to look at it, we didn't see anything I mean, wrong with lo it. Looking at the head, I didn't s I didn't think there would be any issue with the head. I didn't initially see any issue with the head. Figured I'd just kind of pressure wash it off and it'd be good to put back on without doing anything to the valves. So I started cleaning it up, looking at the valves, and I kind of expected to maybe, because of the heat, maybe see the intake valves all blued. They were still just nice and shiny as can be. The exhaust did show a little bit of discoloration. And I'm like, well, okay, those are exhaust valves. Maybe that's just the way they look. There were some comments about us having put valve stem seals on this head when they didn't originally have seals. Our experience with this is you can take one of these older engines put positive valve stem seals on and that seal will actually meter the oil to the guide as opposed to just depending on some splash to that guide once in a while. 
you can cut down your amount of oil consumption and at the same time have better lubrication, better continuous lubrication to the valve guide. So we did want to pop some valves out just to look. You know, I wanted to see, okay, are, are these stems too dry? And I started thinking with all this heat, it wouldn't have surprised me if I'd have found some exhaust valves that had been extremely hot and maybe started to uh, gall in the valve guide. So we pulled some out, started looking at them, and I was very pleased uh, to see that there was no unusual wear or, or any metal transfer between the valve and the guide, and there was plenty of lubrication in the guide, even though we had the positive seals on there. But uh, maybe you need to talk about what your uh, eagle eyes there found that I initially overlooked. You had pulled this valve out, and I'm looking at it, and I'm like, dude, it's cracked. And we got looking at these valves a little bit closer, and at least three of them have little tiny heat check cracks coming in basically in that transition area. So we did talk to the manufacturer of these valves, and basically they said that it's another indication of extreme combustion heat and extreme combustion pressures. Delight faced valve, it had to have been extremely hot to have cracked it all the way across the stellite. Must have been extreme pressure in the combustion chamber pushing on that valve and that creates these little cracks coming out. It's literally trying to push the head of the valve through the valve seat. So on the head you should uh, put some, you should do the die on these and do that while I'm talking. Okay. So at that point we decided well we better actually take apart, you know, fully take apart the head and maybe go through it so checked the valve guides, valve guides were fine. So we pulled the exhaust seats out, given how hot we assumed they had been. Left the intake seats alone because we don't have insane, you know, no insane signs of anything on the intake seats. Yeah, put new exhaust seats in, we cut changed, all the seats, put all new valves Because in. of the excessive heat, especially in this one that was starting, that had cracked and starting to burn through, you could see the dark spot on the valve seat. And from experience, we know that when a valve has burned out or an engine's been overheated, it'll often shrink the valve seat, and it may look fine when you do the valve job, but about two weeks later, that seat falls out, and you end up with catastrophic failure. So I never hesitate to change valve seats on an engine, especially one like this. I didn't feel like there was any excessive heat in the intake valve, because of course it's pulling in cool air all the time anyway and the valves had nice color you know these here you can see there's there's kind of a discoloration those should have been nice shiny um, like that there's a good one there with the rainbow color in the top of it you know I was just noticing this is the same color as mom's car <laughs> and I scratched the fender over here the other day don't, please I, don't. You, you think I could touch it up with that I would rather if you didn't okay I won't today so what we're doing here is putting, doing kind of a dye crack penetration test. What do you call it? Yes, it's a, a dye penetrant test. You spray this dye on whatever you're trying to check for cracks. Let it set here for a few minutes, and I think we've probably been here long enough at this point that I could wipe this off. The idea is that dye has pulled itself down into those cracks. Yeah, it will have penetrated into the crack after I've got it wiped clean on the surface. We did engrave little numbers on the top of the valves here so we can tell which cylinders they oh, came which. out of. Yeah, This is our developer. I don't know exactly what this is. I just always called it talcum powder. Yeah, um, some kind of a, a white powder that will attract the color back up out of that valve if there's any cracks in there. Wow, that makes it easy to see. While we're waiting on those to kind of dry, the signs of cavitation starting on the cylinder liners, somebody emailed us, I think, and sent us an article. And basically it was talking about all the different factors, including coolant quality, but what it really comes down to is the vibrations in the yeah. engine causing that. Yeah, because when we first pulled those sleeves out, I didn't touch on that very much other than it went through my mind I was a little disappointed to see what the back side of those cylinders were looking like and I'm like well 
I don't know what's going on here. Maybe I maybe my coolant wasn't as good a coolant as I thought it could be. But I I didn't give it a whole lot of thought until uh, that was pointed out to us. And you did find the article that talks about the more vibration you have in there, the more that will create that problem. You know, that's another reason. You know, we had people tell us, oh, you need to open that thing up so it has all kinds of clearance. Well, you open that up for all kinds of clearance and you're also going to have more vibration as that piston slams into the side of that cylinder while it's going up and down and create more of that cavitation problem. That kind of drives with our, you know, advanced timing or detonation yeah. theory. I don't have any proof of this, but I can just imagine the piston trying to come up, but it's too far down in the hole as it's, as combustion is starting yeah. and it's fighting itself and probably just kind of... yeah. Knocking that, back and forth in th there. That article you found had a video with it also that really showed that piston coming up and as it goes, the rod goes over center and then that piston slams against the cylinder wall on the other side as it comes back down. You know, you talk about slamming on there four or five thousandths clearance, that doesn't sound like a lot, but at the speed these things run and the amount of force that's on there, uh, four thousandths can be quite a force on that cylinder wall creating vibration on there and then in turn creates the cavitation and erosion on the outside. So whether it means anything or not, that's one theory. <laughs> yeah, that, that's one more thing we found, one more thing we learned. So there's our valve that has the obvious crack in it. The obvious crack and you can see all those little heat checks. I don't know if you can see it on this one. There's I'll set it down here. See right in there, some little teeny tiny ones yeah. starting. So that's on number, that's number six valve. Which so that was sense. a back cylinder, which was a bad one. This is number, number four. Number four cylinder was one that was fine. I don't necessarily see anything on that. This is number five, was a bad cylinder. Not really see anything there. Number one, obviously cracked, big old crack. That one was getting ready to turn into a blowtorch. Yeah, that, uh, I don't think we'd have had to run that engine very much longer and that, that would have opened, completely open. Because even on the, the combustion chamber side of it here, you can see a little divot in there where it has started to, uh, the metal has started to go away on there. Yeah. And this is number two, which the cylinder looked a little funny on number two but it wasn't it wasn't scored but yet. that's the cylinder that looked like the cross hatch was all worn out i believe because of the end gap of the ring had come together from the heat we feel kind of good going back together yeah at this I, point. I feel good going back together with this i don't feel like there's any issue there i still have a knot in my stomach over the injection pump and the fuel i i wish we hadn't lost a smoking gun on the injection pump and we'll find out on the fuel here. We should know by the end of the week here. And I guess at that point, if we eliminate or, or we condemn the fuel, regardless, I'm gonna dump out what fuel's left in the tractor and put in fresh, getting it back together, and hopefully we don't see it back again for this reason. Next video, hopefully, we'll be running. Yeah, hopefully the next time we'll, you we'll see. We'll run through some of the last assembly stuff and some other things that we're adding to it, and hopefully have it running.